Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live from Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Melissa Klebe. I'm the Director of Education here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I'm joined by Dr. Miriam Galindo. Hello, Dr. D. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. And today we are going to be talking about uh, resistance to care, which a lot of caregivers often find themselves facing in various points in their caregiving journey how we can understand that, how we can respond and to care. And um, I want to start off by thanking our sponsor for today, Irvine Clinical Research. ICR has been a great community partner of ours for a long time. They are a clinical research company out of Irvine, um, do lots of research on um, memory loss and other uh, disorders. And so uh, if you're interested in learning more, please visit Irvine very, very thankful for their sponsorship today. And so um, we're gonna dive into it. Um, today, we're going to kind of share a little bit of our experiences. Dr. Galindo and I have both been caregivers for a long time um, and obviously professionals in the dementia care space. And so we can kind of pull from both of those experiences. Um, this is a really hard, hard thing for caregivers to face. Um, we're trying to do our best. We're trying to help our loved ones and assist them with various personal care tasks and other things. And, and oftentimes we're met with resistance and we don't know why that is. We're trying to help this person, right? We're trying to help our loved one. And so, and we find that, you know, why are they making it, you know, hard for us? What's going on? Are they doing this on purpose? Um, and so we're gonna kind of talk about reasons why this may be happening and, and how we can rethink what's happening. Um, Cause often in the moment, you know, we just wanna kind of get through it. We just wanna, fix it. And um, we don't always have time to kind of analyze what's going on. That's kind of the last thing we want to do, right? When we're faced with this resistance right. is take a step back and think about, well, why might this be happening? Let me, let me jot some notes down and think about what's going on. You know, in the moment, you're just trying to handle the situation. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to talk about these things ahead of time and, and try and plan for them and, and be proactive so that we can hopefully lessen you know these kind of crisis situations um and handle them better when when they do arise um and so you know today we hope that you walk away with some ideas um, we're going to brainstorm together we're going to talk about a very common issue which is um, resistance during bathing which is a very very personal task um, but we can talk about any other activities too we invite you to share in the comments as always share your comments questions things that have worked for you, things that have gone terribly for you. We all learn from each other's experience mm -hmm. and everyone is different. Um, so we really, really encourage you to uh, share along with us. Um, and, and before we go on, I'll just kind of read this quote here. Um, you know, can we step back from a person expressing resistance and think, what are they teaching me right now about my approach? Mm -hmm. And that is a very uh, high level of, of awareness and thinking. And obviously, as I mentioned, not something we typically are ready to do in the moment mm -hmm. of a crisis situation. Um, but if, if we're facing this problem that's happening over and over again, um, we really need to think about our approach and, mm -hmm. and ways that we can change it going forward because just kind of fixing the situation in the moment over and over again, you're just gonna keep finding yourself in that same right. situation. It's gonna be like Groundhog Day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Linda, anything to add there? No, you, you've you're saying it right on um prevention is 95 percent of uh, uh what we need to focus on and then the, the other thing too is um there's only three things that can possibly be changed when you meet uh, you know resistance the other person yourself or the environment and in other um uh, Facebook presentations we've emphasized that you can't change your loved one they're doing the best they can with what they've got yeah um, and what they've got, we're going to describe in the next slide, which is they're dealing with a, yeah. um, progressive degenerative brain change over time. And if we remember that as caregivers, it softens our approach and it helps us focus on what can we change. So let's go through this um, image here of the brain and I'll describe what happens with uh, dementia and and then I'll add what specifically happens with Alzheimer's type of dementia since that's the most common. So here we've got a cutaway uh, view of the brain and as you know for those of you who are caring for somebody with dementia there are a number of different types of subcategories of dementia so not all dementias are 
caused or, um, or involved the same sort of progression. In Alzheimer's type, for example, there are plaques and tangles that create a toxic environment in the brain that cause brain cells to die one by one. And in other types of dementia, there are other, um, you know, involved characteristics. But generally speaking, what happens over time are certain portions of the brain are dying according to um, how many cells are dying in the brain. And you can imagine there are plenty of cells. So this progression happens over time. For Alzheimer's, it's often 20 years before you see outward signs. But those outward signs, the behavior, speech, memory, all of those things are brain, um, they're related to the brain, right? Your brain is responsible for your speech, your memory, your behavior, your perceptions, your um, senses, your sense of sight, your um, sense of hearing, touch, taste, all of those are controlled by the brain. So when we look at this, we've got in the center of that brain, what looks like a hole right in the middle of it is actually a portion of the brain called the, um, well, there's other portions too, but right in the center, I would say generally speaking, is the amygdala, which is responsible for the emotional, um, emotional area of the brain. And that would simply be what it sounds like, just pure, raw, rage, sadness, joy, it's all right there. The rest of the brain that surrounds it, that looks like a lot of lumpy things all um, clustered together, that is the thinking brain, that's the rational brain. And um, it's responsible for organization, thinking, um, abstract reasoning, which means if you say something like, um, uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss. You don't literally mean a rolling stone doesn't pick up grass along the way. You mean um, keep on moving and bad things won't happen, right? But that abstract thinking is corresponding with the brain. And if, if your brain cells start to die, you're going to lose that, as well as your organizational abilities, your directionality, your ability to use logic, um, your ability to create order. Step one, step two, step three, step, step four, when brain cells die, that's difficult. Language, your ability to either understand what's being said to you or your ability to put thoughts into words corresponds with the brain. And so when cells die, that's going to go away as well. Short-term memory, meaning what did you just do an hour ago? What did you do for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? Who was there? That's short-term memory, where long-term memory would be, what did I do for a living? Where did I live when I was a child? Short-term memory is often affected with dementia as well. And we need to keep this in mind when we're talking about things like um, being a caregiver, giving directions, um, including directions on bathing and um, dressing. Because if we have long sentences, by the time we get to the end of the sentence, they're going to forget what you just said at the beginning of the sentence. So short, short term memory is affected. Sensory perception and vision. I want to emphasize that when it comes to things like taking a shower. We have to remember that it's that dementia is not just about memory. Dementia also affects the senses. So for example, the temperature of the water is going to be perceived differently than the way you and I perceive temperature. The pelting of the water on the skin might be perceived as painful, where to us it might be perceived as um, not painful and actually just fine and maybe even nice. Um, vision is going to be affected. The, the, um, the shower coming out of the wall might look threatening, where to you and I, we discount it because we're so used to it. And then, as you can see, at the very base of the brain, there's what looks like a tube going down the person's throat. And that's this is the brain stem. That is often the last to be affected um, when we're talking about Alzheimer's. At end stage Alzheimer's, the swallowing, the um, breathing, the heart rate, that's controlled by the brain stem. And then that little ball at the very base of the brain is a cerebellum. 
and that's responsible for balance and coordination. This is also something we have to keep in mind when it comes to shower time, that the ability to coordinate one's movements or even stand in a shower um, it can create alarm because if you're not coordinated and you feel like somebody's pushing you to do something, whether literally or figuratively, faster than you're willing to go, um, it, it can create a lot of fear. So all of this to say that every behavior you see with your loved one, everything they say, everything they're trying to comprehend that's coming out of your mouth is controlled by the brain. And when those cells are dying one by one, it becomes more and more difficult for them, which again, comes down to who are we gonna be able to change? Them, us, or the environment. We cannot change them. They're doing the best they can. So it comes down to what can I do differently or what can I change in the way I'm doing things to help them be at their best and to help this be a more pleasant experience as opposed to a painful experience or frightening experience. So we then go on to the next slide. And Melissa, you can take this one. Yeah, sure. I mean, and I think you set the stage perfectly with talking about all the, the very real changes that are happening in the brain that all contribute to what we see when we see the ultimate kind of result as what we call resistance to care, right? We just think, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. they're just being difficult. They're doing this on purpose. And we mm -hmm. forget, you know, because we can't see all those changes happening in the brain, we forget that, you know, they they're not able to communicate as they once were. Um, yes. If they, if the water temperature was off or it was painful to them, you know, and it, previously they may have been able to just say that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm off balance. The water doesn't feel great. I, you know, I'm uncomfortable. And if they're unable to express that to us, then it might come out in a different way. It might come out as get away from me or I, right. I'm not gonna go into the bathroom with you or Absolutely. you know I'm, I'm gonna hold on to my clothes. I don't wanna take them off. I can't tell mm -hmm. you I'm cold or uncomfortable but this is just what I'm doing right now. So we really, I mean, it's, it's challenging for us and it's gonna take longer to kind of sort out mm -hmm. what might be going on and, and what they're telling us through their resistance. Um, but it's worth it to try and figure it out in the end. And so mm -hmm. um, we often think, well, I'm, I'm speaking in a calm voice or I'm, you know, I'm doing some things that I should be doing and I'm still facing this resistance, but there's just so much. And when we think about the example of bathing in particular, there's so many factors that are in play there that we just sometimes don't even know where to start. But these are some common reasons that we've we've mentioned before that why our typical approaches might not work the way that Correct. we hope they would. Right. Um, we're reacting in the moment. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're not trying to dig deeper and figure out what's going on. You know, we meet resistance and then we just say, well, just, you know, it's fine. Let's just get this done you know, mm -hmm. and, and we kind of want to rush through it. And that's our instinct to get it done for both of our sakes, right? So that we can move on to something more right. pleasurable. But the more we do that, the more that that activity is just going to be not enjoyable every time we do it. It's going to leave an emotional memory in their mind, you know, as well as ours. Um, but this was not a pleasant thing. When I go into the bathroom with this person, mm -hmm. it is not a pleasant experience. And I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. And I'm not sure why. But I just remember emotionally right. that this was negative. Right? And, and that's why I emphasize that center portion of the brain, the amygdala, that portion will remember the experience, not the logical, right. rational brain around that portion. So let me show you right here. Perfect. This part right here, the pink part, this is what we caregivers have to speak to the emotional part of the brain, which means every time it's an unpleasant experience, it's gonna be doubly hard to do that same activity in the future because this part's going to quote, remember the experience. This part is supposed to be interpreting this part, but this part is compromised. So if we remember we're speaking to this, which means the goal is try to make it as pleasant as possible and minimize disruption, minimize pain, fear, anxiety, and you'll be able to um, successfully accomplish the task and have it be repeated in the fu future. So we're gonna talk about some of these, what makes it fail and then what we can do to succeed so that um, that task can be replicated in the future in a pleasant way. Absolutely, that was a great example you just, and it made me think of something, you know, when, when you are, at a, are in an uncomfortable situation, let's say I'm at the dentist and I hate the dentist, right? I just, I wanna mm -hmm. get out of there as soon as possible and I'm uncomfortable, but I have that frontal lobe intact and I 
have the self-control to stay in the chair and I have the understanding to know this person's trying to help me. You know, they're not trying to hurt me. Um, I know that I will be better off once I go through this procedure right. or whatever it is. And so I'm able to kind of rationalize and talk myself through it or else I would be out of that chair and, you know, out of there if I didn't you understand got it. what was going on and if I didn't have mm -hmm. the self-control. And those are the pieces that are, you know, starting to be affected. And so if all mm -hmm. we're experiencing is this discomfort and we don't, kind of understand what's going on. No one's kind of talking us through it. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have that kind of, you know, overriding self-control to just kind of bear it out, even if it is uncomfortable, then, you know, mm -hmm. what do we expect from a person that is, you know, starting to lose the ability to, to control those things. Right. You, um, you got it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so simple if we just talk about it, but in the moment right. it's, it's very difficult and we yeah. both have experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other things that I'll just mention briefly, because we'll talk about, as we talk about the example of bathing, um, not being person centered, not incorporating things like their preferred routine or their preferred products. If we're talking about bathing, um, you know, the task doesn't seem like it has any meaning to them. Why am I even doing this? Mm -hmm. um, we are superimposing our approach on an environment not suitable to them. So let's say, you know, the bathroom is just a mess. It's oh, cluttered, it's yeah. noisy, it's cold, yeah. especially mm -hmm. with things in the bathroom, right? And we're just trying to talk gently and smile. Those things can go a long way, but they can't always make up for an environment mm -hmm. that is just not suited to that task. And that that is so distracting to that person that they can't possibly tune that out, even if they wanna do their best for you and, and you know, kind of do this task. Um, and then finally, if, if our approach doesn't serve to enhance the well-being of the person, um, and we'll talk about this, this is a kind of a, a big topic, um, but, you know, essentially just just making sure that, um, you know, we are we are taking care of all of the possible unmet needs of this person. Do they feel mm -hmm. comforted? Are they secure? Do they feel mm -hmm. like they have choice? Um, there's so many things that go into our well-being that um, dementia can can take away, unfortunately, and, mm -hmm. and we as as caregivers can unwittingly and, and not on purpose at all. But, um, you know, as we're just going through our tasks, we sometimes, it's hard to, to keep all those balls in the air to keep, you mm -hmm. know, to make sure the person is, is feeling as secure and comforted as possible while we're trying to do this task that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot that goes into it. But that means there's a lot that we can try. We have a lot that's of right. options available. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. So, so let's get to yeah. our examples. So why don't you start with the example and then we're going to talk about how we can slow ourselves down as caregivers um, to focus on making that task as successful as possible, as pain-free as possible, as pleasurable as possible, and, um, and get you on your way to uh, some positivity as a caregiver. So Melissa, why don't you talk about this storyline here? Yeah. This is, I mean, this could be my story, basically. I think it could be many yeah. <laughs> stories that eventually yeah, are right. faced with um, doing this task. But I, I faced this with my mom, who I, I care for, and who now has late stage Alzheimer's, but um, kind of in that middle stage where she was not really desiring to shower as much, um, you know, kind of didn't, or, or would tell me that she had already showered. You know, I'd kind of be mm -hmm. like, oh, have you, you know, taken a shower today? Do you want me to start the water free? She'd be like, oh, no, I already did that. And, you know, of course, mm -hmm. it's been a couple of days. Um, and, and I used to see that as well. She's just lying to try to get out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't necessarily the case. It could have been that she, I like the way Tifa snow puts it. She has an old memory in a new place. She probably has mm -hmm. memories of taking showers every day. Like she did for her whole life. Um, and she thinks, well, of course I, I showered, mm -hmm. you know, it's the middle of the day or whatever it was. So either way, whatever the reason I would face resistance constantly with this, it was mm -hmm. just something that, you know, she didn't want to do, she didn't want me to have any part of it. Um, sometimes she'd go into the bathroom and, and, you know, I'd have started the water and she'd just sit there for a while and then mm -hmm. turn the water off and come out. And I knew that nothing had really happened in there, but I didn't, I didn't know where to begin. I didn't know how to approach it. And I didn't want to, you mm -hmm. know, kind of force myself on her. Of course, no one wants that situation. So this was really difficult. And I didn't understand, you know, why we couldn't just, you know, why I couldn't help her with this task. Um, but it turns out that the, there's a lot that goes on and a lot that I wasn't even aware of, like things you've talked about being yeah. uncomfortable with, you know, the, just this, the environment of the bathroom mm -hmm. and, and just forgetting how to navigate doing a shower, which is something that, you know, we all do routinely. I can listen to music or something, you know, I don't have to think about what I'm doing, but as that becomes more challenging, it's like, well, what, what do I supposed to do now? What do I do next? Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I, I faced this resistance um, all the time. And, and this was true for me too. If I mentioned the word bath or shower, it was like an immediate, 
no way, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not mm -hmm. even going near that room. <laughs> um, so this is, this is definitely very, very challenging. Um, That's so right. you want to talk a little bit about this model? Yes. Kind of use. Yes. So you said something important. You said, so I didn't even know where to start. And so yeah. this is the place to start. This is the acronym that we use. First, break the task down into ident identifying first what the problem is without imposing any kind of uh, judgment or meaning onto it. You simply say, huh, mom's not taking a shower, or in my case, dad's not taking a shower. Not, you know, he doesn't want to, or he uh, hates showers, because then we've, we're already assuming a cause. We just say he's not taking a shower. And then within that, you want to make sure, is this worth the battle? Some mm -hmm. things that are behaviors may bother us, but they're not necessarily, um, it, it's not worth the struggle. So for example, showering every day may not be as important in the long run as it is to you know our value system we may think showering every day is absolutely important that you do well for your for your loved one it might be showering every other day mm -hmm. um so so anyway identifying the behavioral um the behavior that it, you're wanting to address the next thing then is to explore the potential causes and that is when you you start looking at what's behind this and there's two um well, we'll go into the next slide and I'll talk about breaking that down. The third, though, is adjusting your approach and the environment. And what I mean by that is what I said before. There's three things that can be adjusted, you, the other person, or the environment. One of those we can't change, which is the other person, your loved one. So there's only two things left, which is you or the environment. And I would suggest look at the environment first and then look at yourself. You can certainly do that in combination but just know there are things out there. You're, you're, you may feel like you've exhausted everything, but there are um, options available. We're going to talk about some of those. So let's break down this idea model. So you see in the next slide, by identifying the behavior, mom will not agree to a bath or mom won't take a bath. So we're simply stating a fact. We're not stating the cause. Once we get to the second portion, which is explore the meaning behind the behavior, or why is this behavior occurring, then you brainstorm. And what I wanted to break down with this is, like uh, Melissa was saying, there might be a memory of a negative experience of bathing. Uh, so, for example, all the more reason you don't want to push your loved one to um, have a negative experience because then you're replicating that over time and you can almost guarantee this person's not going to want to take a shower in the future. Um, the other thing to explore, though, is try to see the situation through your loved one's eyes. I can't tell you how helpful that is because we have a tendency to want to look at the situation through our own eyes, through our own brains, and that's not helpful. If we do that, we won't see what the problems are. As soon as we start to see the situation and hear the situation and feel the situation through the brain of our loved one, I promise you, you will see solutions materialize right in front of you. The, the toolbox in your mind will be expanded. So, for example, when you're exploring what's going on with this environment that would look threatening, let me give you some examples from my own experience with my dad. Um, and I could give you other examples from patients, but this is the one that comes to mind. First of all, the shower water was coming out of a regular shower spot spout um, from the wall. That was perceived, when I looked at it, as very threatening. There wasn't any way to escape it. It came, uh, literally, the water would come out of nowhere, right? Because your brain is not able to interpret that water is coming out of there. And when I turn on the faucet, the water will go up here. Your brain can't do that when you've got dementia. So I immediately attached a handheld shower device and that seemed to help in that situation. Another um, uh, thing that I noticed was that the bath mat was dark. 
Well, we have to remember that when you're looking at a situation through the eyes of somebody with dementia, a dark spot on the floor is not necessarily perceived as a mat. It, um, because depth perception is affected with dementia, it can be perceived as a whole. And if you can imagine your, you know, your caregivers trying to force you to step into a hole, then you can understand the panic and you can understand why they get so angry and upset, right? So these are the things I'm talking about. The temperature of the water is so critical. Um, my poor father wasn't able to speak to tell me either the water's too hot or too cold. Um, I would just see a restlessness about him. And I might, I might feel it as warm. To him, it felt cold or to him, it felt hot. So again, you look at the environment through the eyes of your loved one. You also look at how they're perceiving your behaviors. When you're agitated, they're going to get agitated. When you're anxious, they're going to get anxious. When you're calm and you're smiling and you're saying very short sentences, two or three words or less, you're going to get a lot more mileage. Your efforts to logic you know, logically persuade them or reason your way through it with long sentences and your voice is getting agitated, that's not helpful. Because remember, by the time you get to the end of your sentence, they've forgotten what you said at the beginning. All they can hear is a bunch of words coming at them and they can see you're getting impatient. So far better to say things like, this way, um, right here, step here mm -hmm. that's that's far more soothing than to be saying and another thing and another thing and another thing and you've got but and step right here why aren't you doing this and this is you haven't taken a shower and who wants that right yeah and then the final part of the acronym is adjust and we've talked about this you know all along the way but it's worth talking about again approach the situation calmly and patiently. Try using different words. And by the way, you can also try using the same words because sometimes the issue is they haven't caught it the first time and it's worth repeating. Um, it's also worth waiting till the, what I used to call the gears shift. Mm. If, if your loved one has an agitated or an upset look on their face, don't keep pelting them with words. Wait till they look calm and then try again. And you may want to just use the same words because um, the processing speed is slowed down when you, when, um, when you do have dementia. Second thing, ensure that the bathing environment is pleasant and maintain modesty throughout. I can't underscore how important that is. Um, we caregivers really minimize how important that is. If you can imagine um, somebody inexplicably trying to rip your clothes off, um, you would be frightened, you would be angry, you would feel attacked. And it doesn't matter what they're saying because I don't understand what you're saying anyway. You, you've got words coming out of your mouth and you're taking off my clothes. I don't like the feeling of this, right? So it's okay if the person wants to wear a little towel in the shower. It's okay. And if the towel gets wet, that's okay. Um, there are clever ways that you can go about making sure that the shower time stays enjoyable and that the anxiety is minimal. For my dad, intuitively, I knew he needed a little sh a little towel around him in the shower. And so he did that and the towel will get soaking wet and so be it. Um, it doubled as a washcloth. I could, you know, scrub him with the towel, but for him, it allowed him to it relieve that anxiety. Um, the third thing, enlisting an authority figure, someone she respects or somebody he respects and wants to please, this is golden. Um, and it may come as simple as, you know, Dr. So-and-so says, uh, says so, or 
Uh, you talk about uh, a brother or an uncle who say this is what we need to do. Um, it doesn't matter if it's not logical. As long as the person responds with, oh, okay, um, you, you can use that to, to help. And remember, we're speaking to the emotional brain, not the logical brain. So if, if a reference to aunt so-and-so calms the person, then you've discovered something that's gonna be very, very helpful. And then the last thing to adjust, and this is very important, pair the desired behavior with a positive association. What we mean by that is whatever you want to accomplish, pair it with something that is pleasant to them. So for example, for shower time, pairing it with music is, is extremely helpful. Um, because what it does is help um, create a non-anxious environment or a positive environment. There may be other things that you can pair it with. Like for example, um, once we finish the shower, no, you're not saying this, I'm saying this to you. Once you finish the shower, that then it's dinner time or then it's TV time. Or then for my dad, it was dance party time. We always had a dance party after shower time. And that was something that his brain wouldn't remember, but his emotional brain surely did. Um, so those four concepts are really important. The adjustment on you, your calmness, your patience, your um, willingness to use short sentences, uh, making sure that the environment is not anxious, making sure that you enlist an authority figure that supports that lack of anxiety, and then um, pairing that desired behavior with a positive association. And we're big fans, Melissa and I, of pairing music with the desired yes. behavior. Yes, because that'll speak to that brain, that, uh, that amygdala. It just changes the whole mood, I think, too, of whatever you're doing. When you have music on, it's just, I mean, yeah. as long as it's music that the person enjoys. Um, I've also heard of people doing like a, a treat in the shower, or like a yeah. sucker or a candy, you know, yeah. I mean, anything, I mean, anything. you know, anything that's safe and the person enjoys. Um, I wanted to mention one thing on the using different words. And just to clarify, that was more about um, for me, for my mom, words like bath and shower are very triggering. Yes. So I would start to say things like, let's, you know, it's time to get cleaned up or just something yes. kind of a little less, um, you know, abrasive to her. So, you know, yeah. can we just um, underscore that? And um, maybe those who are watching would also recognize this. It, you do stay away from trigger words. And yeah. to it's, especially in the later stages of dementia, it's not worth saying okay it's shower time first we're gonna do this 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 it's not i'll tell yeah. you when it was shower time i never used the word shower because nope. i knew like your mom my father would react to that so it really came down to steps first we do this and i wouldn't say what it was we're yeah. doing this now we're gonna go this way now you're gonna step here even getting into the shower stall was a big deal and yeah. so there was a lot of theatrics involved with my mom would go in first and then she'd pretend that she dropped something and she really needed his help. And then he'd go in, she'd escape and get out. And, you know, so there was a lot of cleverness that went into yeah. the shower. But definitely, you're right. Stay away from the trigger words. Yeah, for me, it was I started to just say, you know, well, why don't we do your hair really nice and curly. She there loved, you, you know, having her hair curled and stuff. So we'd always start with that. It's, yeah. you know, okay, well, I got to wash it to do that. And then I'd kind of, you know, sometimes we'd even just not take a full on bath. I'd just do her yes. hair and kind of wash, you know, her upper body. And then we'd take care of the rest later. And so there's just so many different ways that it doesn't have to be this idea that we have of this full blown shower that we all do, you know, we just need to kind of change, I think, our, you know, think outside the box a little bit and, and see what will work for that's that person. Right. And, and it may change, you know, that, that something may work for a few months and then that's not working anymore. And so we need to change it up again. And that's OK. You know, just being able to be flexible as well. That's right. That's right. So the tips. So, yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Why don't you start and, and I'll join in. Sure. Yeah, so this is, I mean, stuff that we've touched on some of it. Planning ahead, I think is really important, especially mm -hmm. for the shower, probably the most important thing to be planning ahead for. 
you don't want to have to be leaving to go get things and you know you don't want to have things not no. set up and then the person's just kind of sitting there right. and, waiting and you know kind of giving them a chance to get out of there so if we have everything set up ahead of time have a bunch of warm towels have the water prepared yes. all your products you know music if you're gonna have that or candle or whatever it is um, just and then it takes the pressure off of you yes. you can kind of just relax you don't have to be rushing around to go get something the more urgent and rushing around you are the mm -hmm. more that's going to translate as you said to that person feeling like well i need to be rushing around i'm mm -hmm. now i'm anxious you know and so that's, that's right even those little things can really make a, a big big difference so just planning ahead yes. is important having that routine that works for your person and and maybe it's you know a, the time of day they always love to shower before maybe that still holds true maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. and and it's okay mm -hmm. to think about well, you know, they always used to take a shower in the morning and I don't know why they wouldn't want to still do that, but maybe they're not as awake or aware in the morning as more. Maybe That's the correct. afternoon is a better time for them. Mm -hmm. You know, just kind of taking note of the day. When are they happiest? When do they seem like they are kind of most, you know, with it? And and maybe that's the time that you can, you know, take advantage of to, to mm -hmm. start to do a little more diff difficult of a task. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned about being patient, choosing your words carefully, enlisting a loved one you want to please going slow again this can't be stated enough to just just not mm -hmm. rushing and it's totally against our intuition is to want to rush through it to just get it done with we've mm -hmm. all been there but again it's going to leave that bad taste in their mouth it's it's you're, you're gonna it's gonna take you longer in the long run if you are fighting them if you are mm -hmm. able to do it with them you know it's gonna save you time and in fact it might even become something enjoyable i know that's hard to think about if bathing is always a rough time for you and, and it definitely was for me but then it became something more enjoyable and i know it did for mm -hmm. you too dr glendo mm -hmm. and it, yeah, it became definitely. this activity and um right. it's something you know my dad does with her now and he enjoys it and we years ago we never would have thought never in a million years that that bath time or shower time would be an enjoyable thing that we would right. do together yeah. um you know so so you never know it might, it might surprise you yeah. um using favorite products and this last one i think is really important encouraging them to participate as much as possible yes. don't yes. assume they can't do it don't be doing it to them um have them yeah do as much as possible because mm -hmm. i think a lot of times the resistance can be you know kind of a, a response to feeling like their choices are being taken away mm -hmm. and their autonomy their free will is being mm -hmm. taken away especially with something personal that normally you're doing by yourself for your whole life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really saying here's, here's the washcloth. And, and even if they just hold it, even that's fine. Mm -hmm. They're participating and um, they don't exactly have to be right. doing it. You know, think about ways that they can, you know, here, can you hold the soap? Can you pour, can you squeeze this bottle onto this? Um, you know, can you do your hair, whatever it is that they, that they can do and just give them the option to try. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. That's um, right. So, yeah. <laughs> You know, the, um, the the last two points that you made, I'll reiterate. So the favorite scents, music, and products, we're talking about their favorite scents, yeah. music, and products. As much <laughs> as you'd like to hear your own music, this isn't right. the time. Because what you're trying to do is also stimulate those portions of the brain that can generate autonomous movement. So yeah. when you've got their favorite soap, remember your olfactory senses are connected to your brain. And when your brain is remembering, oh, this smell, the chances of that activity then kind of going on automatic pilot, like you start to wash yourself despite your lack of recognition or lack of awareness that you're taking a shower, it, it, there is some ability to do things automatic pilot, right? And then yeah. to encourage them to participate as much as possible. Um, Definitely, we want to do this. This is so um, that incorporating a routine that we talked about um, as the second point helps in this area. So, for example, if you notice that your loved one always seems to start washing their left arm, then they go to their right arm, and then they do one leg, then they do the other leg, well, repeat that the next shower left arm, right arm, leg, leg, because the more you're doing it in their, yeah. according to their own rhythm, the less you're going to get those anxious reactions. I know when I was um, shaving my dad, blade shave, I can't believe he oh, trusted yeah. me to do his neck. Um, <laughs> but 
I had watched him over time so many times shaving that I knew his routine. I knew he always started on the left. He'd go to the right. He'd, mm -hmm. Then he'd do this, and then he'd do his chin last. And so when it was finally, you know, he, he graduated and allowed me to do it, I did the same routine because in my mind, looking at the situation through uh, my loved one's eyes, I imagined that if I disrupted his own personal routine that he had been doing for a good 70, well, okay, he wasn't born <laughs> with a beard, but pretty close, um, maybe um, 60 years of shaving, um, that um, he would likely get anxious or he'd likely get angry because that's not consistent with what he's used to. Same thing with the smell of the shaving cream. Same thing with the style of the blade. Um, so all of those things are really important to speaking to the remaining portions of the brain that are still active, still viable, and to which we truly need to give our respect because that person is still in there. That loved one of yours is still in there. It's just up to us caregivers to reach them and to speak their language. And so smells, routines, repeating patterns, all of that is reaching that area that's still in there. Absolutely. I, I wanted to read a comment from, from Barbara. She said, great presentation. Where were you when I needed you? And that, <laughs> both, that comment both makes me really happy and also breaks my heart a little bit. And I totally yeah. relate because in the first few months of when I was struggling with this, and this was before I worked for Alzheimer's Orange County, you know, as a caregiver long before that. And and I uh, I felt similarly when I would stumble on helpful things that I was like, why didn't I find this yeah. a year ago, you know? And mm -hmm. it was like, things like draping her with a towel didn't even yeah. occur to me. You know, I was kind of like, well, we just have to, she just has to take all her clothes off and that's, she has to be sitting there and that's that's just how we, and, I, and then I just kind of kicking myself like, oh my gosh, this would have made it so much easier if I would have just taken this different approach. And yeah. and it kind of just seems to always go like that. But I hope that, you know, through that comment, this this is helpful to some people that either are approaching that stage or haven't yeah. gotten there yet or can share these tips with with friends and family because I think they are um, incredibly helpful and, mm -hmm. and even have been to me in other situations since learning them. So, um, and, and other things we haven't even touched on here with bathing are, are things like equipment. You mentioned the handheld shower mm -hmm. um, thing, which is really helpful. Um, but other things like a shower chair or a shower, shower bench chair. that yeah. can, you know, then they mm -hmm. don't have to worry about standing and feeling uneasy. Right. Um, there's so many tools and, and equipment, you know, things out there for bathing. Um, there's even draping garments they make, but I think towels, a yeah. warm towel works just fine. But if they, you know, if you wanted something a little more fancy well, or fashionable there's all kinds of products out there and melissa there's even soapless soap so on the days right. that you feel yeah, like you know, about that. <laughs> yeah remember i had said uh, first gauge whether or not the battle is worth it there are days right. where your loved one's just going to resist and resist no matter what clever trick you try and we have to re-examine our values like i said before is it absolutely necessary to take a shower every single day probably not so there is such a thing as soapless soap. Um, and on those days, you can say, you know, then let me just fluff up your hair. You don't have to say, mm -hmm. and I'm going to use soap and water. You don't need to do that. I'm just going to, you know, scrub and just scrub a little bit. I'm just going to, you know, scrub your back. Um, so the way I used to think about it is if there is a need there's probably some genius out there on the yeah. internet who's invented something, you know, and um, sure enough, I always found something and it might be in a, you know, from a different country or whatever, but there's always some genius who's gone through it before. And that brings us to how to be proactive, bring together your care partner yeah. team. Well, here we're talking not only about maybe family members and people, uh, you know, being incorporated into the routine according to their strengths. But we're also talking about people out there like Alzheimer's Orange County or your internet community. You know, like I said before, that if, if there's a need, there's probably somebody smarter than me that already invented it. I'm going to look for it. Um, taking notes, what works, what yeah. doesn't work. 
you can certainly do um, mental notes, but it's it, it seems to have a more powerful effect when you're actually writing it down. This is what I did. One, two, three, four, five. This worked today. Yeah. Make sure the person is very well known. I agree with this. I think um, rotating caregivers, well, it seems like it, you know, it could help the caregiver so they don't get burnt out. It's hard or on people with dementia. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard because they have to start all over and you're you're dealing with somebody who cannot, they already have trouble with memory as it is. They already feel threatened as it is. They already feel anxious. And now you're introducing something new. And that something new is something we've got to be aware of for the env entire environment. So new soap, new shampoo, new um, lighting, new time of day. We want to minimize that as much as possible. You keep things the same, the same, the same. See through their eyes, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. instead of your own. And for us, look beyond the present challenge to enhancing well-being everywhere. Totally agree with that and something we want to reinforce for you that, yes, it's going to be difficult. There are going to be aspects that are difficult. And that's why we want to re-examine our own values and ask ourselves, is this, is this something that has to be done? If so, how are we going to do it? And we want to make sure that instead of thinking about tasks, we're talking about now how to enhance their quality of life, minimize anxiety, minimize fear, minimize pain. If you've accomplished that, you've done a good job. If they're still wearing their socks in the shower, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're, once they get wet, they'll take them off anyway. You know, yeah, or you'll, exactly. no one you'll have figure wet out something. On the, right, yeah. right. So if, if they insist, no, I'm keeping my underwear on, no problem. You go into the shower with your underwear on. So, um, so yeah. So don't get discouraged if the first time it's horrible. You just want to make sure that um, you minimize those patterns of negative experiences. So we get to our next slide, which is um, something we've said throughout this presentation today. Since they're the ones experiencing cognitive changes, we're the ones that are going to have to adapt. We're the ones that are going to have to see things through their eyes. They cannot see things through our eyes. They can't help us out. It's up to us to be good detectives and help them. Distress is often the result of an unmet need. It definitely is. And we have to keep in mind that underneath what looks like anger or agitation is actually a lot of fear. And if we can yeah. remember that, then we won't react in kind, meaning we won't be equally angry when what we see is an angry person coming at us. Right. It's hard not to take it personally, um, right. but I think once we begin to kind of separate that out, it, it becomes a little bit easier to, yeah. to handle the situation in front of us. If you don't, That's if right. you're not constantly thinking, well, it's it's all me, it's, you know, mm -hmm. or they're, they're doing this on purpose, um, but it's, Again, always easier said than done. It's it's personal. We're, we're you know we're caring for loved ones. We're caring for people we care about. So, it's it's tough. And so you know we we are here for you. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and we'll we'll talk about our resources at the end. But that that kind of brings us to our conclusion. And I always love ending with this slide just because it mm -hmm. calms me down personally. Um, yeah. Taking a deep breath is something that I think we neglect to do mm -hmm. all day long. Um, do you want to? mention the importance of this sure in fact i was just taking a deep breath just now because i was thinking boy I <laughs> it triggers me every breath. time to take a deep breath which is why i can sit in here <laughs> i haven't taken a deep breath all day um yeah. so this is something that is just critical to maintaining your own um calmness um to maintaining your own psychological well-being and health and your own physical health and that is the importance of taking a deep breath and oxygenating oxygenating all your cells in your body, including your brain cells, your own brain cells. So the importance of this is that you're filling your lungs to capacity on the count of four, you're holding the breath on the count of four, and you're releasing the breath slowly through your mouth on the count of four. Um, again, this is critical 
for your own psychological health and your own physical health. It um, takes away that stress response and um, replaces it with a relaxed response. So make sure you do that three yeah. times a day, right? Makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. It Absolutely. Does. Uh, so thank you for being with us, everyone that was here. We hope this was um, informative and helpful for you. Um, as always, these are recorded. They're available here on Facebook. We put them on our YouTube as well. Um, we have more classes coming up this Friday. We have a presentation about wellness in the time of COVID that's going to be presented by one of our community partners, UCI Cancer Institute. Um, next week on Facebook Live, we'll be talking about how to make the holidays a little more dementia friendly. Um, and on that same day ne uh, next week, we have uh, a brain health class on, on the importance of sleep for brain health. I'll put the link to RSVP for that in the comments. We would love, love, love for you to join us. We have lots of brain health classes, lots of classes on, on many different topics um, that we hope you can join us for. So let me put this real quick. Um, and I want to also mention one of our community partners, Family Caregiver Resource Center. They provide services and support for family caregivers. They have information, caregiver assessments and planning and counseling and education and support groups and respite, all kinds of things. They have services in English, Spanish and Vietnamese. Um, so mm -hmm. if you uh, think you could benefit from their services, please check them out at caregiveroc.org. And I will put that in the comments as well. And then our resources, as always, our helpline is here for you, ready to take your call. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a specific question about something, or if you just want to talk through uh, a difficult situation or just bounce ideas off of someone, um, our helpline specialists are incredible and, and they are, um, they're, you know, encouraging and, and so calm and everything is confidential. And so we'd really encourage you to use that resource. Mm -hmm. um, you know, continue to join us here on Facebook and check out our website for other educational classes that we have going on. Um, and thank you again to Irvine Clinical Research for sponsoring this education. And thank you, Dr. Glinda, for being here as always. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. This was really fun. We've got it a was, lot of comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. All right. Thank you all. And we will see you next time. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.